Good evening, everyone. My name is Renee Battle Brooks. I'm the executive director of the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights. We are the county's civil and human rights education and enforcement agency. We, this, you all have to sit through our commercial. We investigate complaints of civil rights discrimination. We uh, combat human trafficking around the region, ensuring we also ensure equitable access to county government services in the language of the person's preference. And we provide opportunities for the public to learn about social justice issues, such as what we are doing tonight. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome you all tonight to Empowering Voices, a Women's History Month event brought to you in partnership with our office, the library system, and the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Our very, very, very special guest this evening is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. She is extraordinary, and I'm so excited that we have her in conversation tonight. I'm just going to give a brief bio. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, so that you have just a sense of who she is. The brief is rather long because that's how extraordinary she is. So Reverend Dr. Theo Harris is the editor of, actually, let me start here, is the director of Cario Center for Religions, Rights and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary and the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival with the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. She is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church of USA and teaches at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Reverend Liz is the editor of We Cry Justice, reading the Bible with the Poor People's Campaign. She's the author of Always With Us, what Jesus really said about the poor, and co-author of Revive Us Again, Vision and Action and Moral Organizing. She has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Time Magazine, Newsweek, Politico, The Hill, The Guardian, The Nation, Boston Review, CNN, Religion News Service, Service Sojourners, Religion Dispatches, the Grio La Giordano, I should have asked you how to pronounce that. Sorry, <laughs> Salon, Slate, and elsewhere. Reverend Liz has organized among poor and low income communities for 30 years with organizations such as the National Union of the Homeless, the National Welfare Rights Union, the Coalition of Emokali Workers, Domestic, thank you, Workers United, and many more. Raised in a family committed to social justice, civil liberties, and human rights, she has been involved in the movement for her whole life. Reverend Dr. Liz was awarded the Children's Health Watch Campaign Award in 2022, the 30th Annual Freedom Award by the National Civil Rights Museum, the Hunger Leadership Award from the Congressional Hunger Center, and Villanova Peace Award in 2021, each along with the Reverend Dr. William Barber II for their work with the people, Poor People's Campaign. In 2020, she was named one of 15 faith leaders to watch by the Center for the American, for American Progress. I am so sorry. In 2019, she was a Selma Bridge Award recipient and named one of 11 women shaping the church by sojourners. In 2018, she gave the Building a Moral Movement TED Talk at TED Women was named one of the Politico 50 thinkers, doers, and visionaries whose ideas are driving politics, and was also named a Woman of Faith Award recipient by the Presbyterian Church, again, USA. Dr. Reverend Liz received her BA in Urban Studies from the University of Pennsylvania, her MDiv from Union Theological Seminary in 2004, where she was the first William Sloan Coffin Scholar, and her PhD from Union, in New Testament and Christian origins. And that was the brief bio. It is an honor to welcome you and have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so good to be here. We're, we're delighted to have you. And I know Renee did a, a wonderful job, I think, of giving an overview of, uh, of who we have with us. So um, it's just, it really is an honor. And I'm wondering if you could take a, a moment to tell us like just more about your work. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And I think it, it really connects with the, the mission of the office um, that you all are a part of. Um, 
but you know, as that um, bio said, I, I started getting involved in, in justice work um, from a very young age. Um, I was raised in a, a family that saw um, kind of doing the work of justice and kind of building a human rights movement and kind of practicing our faith in the public square, all instructively connected. And so um, I was going to protest when I was a, 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 a small little baby um, and, uh, and then met um, poor and homeless families that were organizing themselves when I went off to college um, in Philadelphia in the 1990s. Um, and that's where I was introduced to you know, Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign. It's where I was kind of mentored by welfare rights activists who had been a part of organizing in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, um, and are still active today. It's where um, I started to, to, to learn and connect up with, with grassroots organizations led by people most impacted by racism, by poverty, by militarism, by ecological devastation, and by this false narrative, this mm. of, of kind of white Christian nationalism. And so, you know, uh, for the past 10 years, I've directed uh, the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice. We're one of the two co-anchor organizations of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, and, and really see our mission to to raise up generations of religious and community leaders that are, are building a movement, a, a human rights movement um, uh, to address and overcome all of the interlocking injustices that plague our, our society. And um, even though I spend most of my time in, in some of the poorest parts of, of this, um, these yet to be United States, um, mm -hmm. I am deeply hopeful um, that actually a, a grassroots human rights, civil rights movement is, um, is building and is growing um, and will have and is in developing the kind of power um, to, to really right the wrongs in our in our world today, because there are many. You know, there's some something that you said, um, you know, this is this is really in your DNA, right? This organizing and uh, letting your voice be heard, attending these public rallies and um, and. and it really, it, it should be, and it was in uh, our DNA as Americans, right? Grassroots is really how we um, were formed. And I, I would love to hear your thoughts about the importance of that and whether that alone is enough. And, you know, what 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 is our responsibility? Just let's take it even out of the religious context, because I do want to talk about that, because I think that is integral. But let's take it out of that for a moment. What is our responsibility as just good citizens? Residents is a broader term. So residents of this country. Yeah, I really appreciate this. I mean, again, we have a, have a kind of a when you look at the history of, of, of this country, um, there's both this strain of, of justice, establishing justice, you know, promoting the general welfare, um, and there's this, this other strain of, of, of the genocide of First Nations, indigenous people, of uh, the enslavement of, um, of, of black people, the kind of unjust immigration policies. Um, you know the exploitation of of workers um, of all races, and so so it's not an easy history. But but when we look through that history, um, uh, we see that that the kind of moments of great social transformations um, mm -hmm. where people are able to, you know, achieve uh, rights and dignity, um, uh, like like were promised in the constitution and in that declaration of independence um, uh, are, are achieved when we, the people, you know, do something together. Um, and, and, you know, when, when you look at that history, uh, successful movements are led by those that are most impacted by the injustices that they're trying to resolve. You know, in the words of Frederick Douglass, those in pain know when their pain is relieved those who would be free must strike the first blow. Um, yeah. But but those movements have to involve people from all walks of life um, and, and see each other as siblings trying to build a better world. Um, and, and, and that has been what drives, I think, really history. You know, when we go back, you know, we're all abolitionists now. When we go back, we, we look at the March on Washington and, and we say, 
we all support this. You know, when we look back, you know, here in Women's History Month, um, you know, we we think that that women's suffrage is is not just a right; it 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 should be expanded and extended um, beyond. Um, yet to achieve, you know, even those um, uh, kind of victories, it it took people, regular people you know, waking up in the morning and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to both take care of myself, take care of my family, but I'm going to be a part of something bigger than that. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to aspire to be and make this nation to, you know, the, the kind of place that everyone can, can thrive and not just barely survive. And so, you know, I, I, I take great hope in that, um, both when I look at history and when I look at people, just regular people doing good work, you know, saying it's not right um, for kids to go to schools where they don't have enough books, you know, it's not right to be um, pitting people against each other, you know, it's not right to, to exclude and, and so hatred, um, you know, we can do better, um, we must do better as a nation, um, and, uh, and, and we have, you know, we have people that are, are dedicating their lives, you know, to, to doing that. And, and, and that's, that's, you know, what, what loftier thing can you do, but to, to be a part of something as a regular person yeah. that, that makes, you know, makes your community better. Yeah. Just two quick things. Kyla. <laughs> um, one, how do we leverage all of this grassroots organizing and having our voices heard in 2024 to really push that ball forward, not just nudge it, but push it forward. How do we leverage this? No, I think that's right. I mean, the organization I direct is called the Cairo Center. And Kairos is an ancient Greek word. It means the kind of opportune time, a decisive moment you know, when the structures of injustice are crumbling and, and new movements for justice and equality and peace are trying to break through, right? Um, and I think 2024 is is that kind of moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the election that we see before us um, is really one where democracy is on the ballot, where living wages and healthcare are on the ballot, where, you know, are we going to further militarize our communities is on the ballot. You know, are, are people going to get to make the decisions that, that impact their lives? Um, and so, you know, but, uh, and so, so, so much is happening. Um, and, and it really is about leveraging grassroots people and grassroots organizing and grassroots communities. Um, you know, we in the poor people's campaign look back at past presidential campaigns and, and, and election cycles, and we rarely hear the kind of issues that really matter to people happening in our, in our kind of more public discourse. Um, uh, but it's, it's those folk who, who are out there that need the living wages, that, that need the healthcare expansion, that need a quality public education for their kids, um, that have the power, you know, to, 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 you know, not just vote, but to, to be, you know, active in this democracy, saying, this is the way we must go. Um, and so, you know, we have said in the Poor People's Campaign, a third of the U.S. electorate um, of eligible voters are poor and low-income people. Um, mm -hmm. when, when we see that group of people as a voting bloc, that is a very powerful voting yeah. block. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the issues that are the main concerns of regular grassroots, everyday, poor and low income people, low wage workers, folks that don't, you know, have to swap healthcare and medicines, you know, with each other, you know, th that, that those very grassroots leaders have the power in their voices and in their votes to transform the whole political landscape. And I'm not talking about a particular party. I'm not talking about a particular candidate. I'm talking about, you know, transforming the political landscape to, to actually be responsive to the, the needs and demands of everyday people. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's what kind of drives our, our political system. Um, and, and, 
you know, we we do have power and, and it matters a lot. And this year is a particularly important one. Um, and so the question about leveraging, you know, these different leaders and these different communities is about reaching out and making sure we're talking about the things that matter and not getting distracted and divided. Um, but it also means, you know, reminding each and every one of us that we actually have a role to play. Um, mm -hmm. that, that sure politicians, you know, play a really important role. Sure, big businesses play a really important role. Sure, you know, other aspects of society are important and we have to all come together and work together. But but we the people, you know, have have that role to play and 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 we must play it. And I I feel confident that we're already playing it and we're gonna play it more. Good. Yeah. It's great. Democracy, right? Civil and human rights are the bedrock of democracy. I suspect that maybe one of your books, the title, um, I wonder if it compares, you know, the life of Christ and, you know, social activism, but we'll get into it. But uh, Kyla, I'm sure you have something you want to ask. I have so many things. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't I'm laughing because I don't even know which question to start with. I want to talk more about grassroots organizing. I want to talk more about how you got involved. But I, th I think I'm going to start and with talking about, you know, Renee mentioned your books, and one of them is um, Revive Us Again, um, Vision and Action and Moral Organizing, which was, you know, I know co-written um, with Dr. Barber. But I'm wondering if you can tell us, like, how, what moral organizing, what does that mean? What does that look like? And and actually maybe even fill out, like, how is that different or how does it, maybe it's symmetrical to grassroots organizing? Yeah, thank you for this. I mean, when we look at like our constitution or when we look at our kind of faith traditions, um, like the, the real moral issues um, that are contained within and that are talked about are things like education mm -hmm. and, and the power to make decisions like democracy, right? Their healthcare, their mm -hmm. adequate housing, right? Somehow in our society over the last couple of decades, um, the kind of morality has been defined as, as very narrowly, you know, about who's marrying whom, or, mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether Jesus was a card carrying member of the NRA, right? You know, these, these kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so I think in the work that we're doing in the poor people's campaign, the work that, that I, I was doing before and continue to do in the Cairo center, when we look at this question of morality, we, we, we want to talk about the things that are, right and wrong, not just left or right. Um, we want to talk about the things that are about, you know, make the difference between life and death um, and, and not just, you know, kind of uh, fiddling while Rome is burning, you know, like, like the, that's what matters when it comes to this question of, of moral organizing and morality. Um, and so when you meet people with, with that in mind, you know, when you connect with people about the things that really matter, um, uh, you know, what is right? Like, how is it that we live in a society that throws out more food than it takes to feed every hungry person, not just in this country, but around the world? And yet we have half of our kids in some kind of food insecure homes, right? Like, you know, when you ask those kinds of questions, those are moral questions, you know, when, when you look at, you know, how budgets are made, our state budgets, our city budgets, our national budget, right? Um, and we see that all this money is going into the military and very little money is going into healthcare and education and kind of the things that, 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 you know, allow for, for young people to flourish, for our communities to, to flourish, you know, when, when we look at the, the, question that we haven't raised the federal minimum wage in 13 years. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that like, you know, now we, we have all these new kind of titles for low wage workers um, and we give them lots of praise, um, but we refuse to, to actually live, you know, raise people's wages to a living wage. Mm -hmm. Like these are the moral questions that they're they're political they're economic they're social as well but but they're also just about this question of right and wrong and what we have found is that when we go from arkansas to alabama from like a tiny rural um county to a, a, a you know highly dense metropolitan area that when you when you meet people around these moral questions 
um, there's a lot that people have in common. There's a lot that people are prepared to do something about. There's a lot that people are bothered by, but also can imagine that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and so a lot of the moral organizing we're doing is about both instilling that hope, that possibility that, that poverty is not inevitable, that mm -hmm. systemic racism doesn't have to end the day, uh, that like we can actually save the earth and everything living in and on it. Um, mm -hmm. And like, and, and that we don't have to just kind of lower our standards, but instead we can organize ourselves into, you know, the kind of society um, that we want to live in. You know, I, I think about this, this quote, one of my favorites from Reverend Dr. King, when he was talking about power, especially power for poor and low income people. And he says, you know, power for poor people will mean having the togetherness, the assertiveness, the aggressiveness to make those in power say yes when they may be desirous of saying no. To me, that's moral organizing, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get those in power to say yes? Yes to healthcare, yes to you know expanding our libraries, yes to um, protecting our voting rights, even expanding them, you know, yes to you know, including everybody, everybody in, nobody out. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, equal protection under the law being non-negotiable. You know, these bedrock issues, how do we get turn from getting yeses instead of no, no, we can't expand healthcare. No, we aren't going to protect voting rights. You know, and and we've gotten used to no, but when we do moral organizing, when we go community to community, we connect up with people, we we find that people are hungry for mm -hmm. something better and different. Um, and are prepared to get involved and organize themselves and their communities into something where we can all kind of be revived again and 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 see that that um, that life can be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's yeah, that's inspiring too. I mean, you know, like just I I'm not surprised to hear that people come together on these issues, and I I think that as a way to mobilize people, um, I can understand how it resonates, and you know, you're seeing great success. And I I wanted to to ask about. As you're talking about this, am I right in thinking that a lot of the organizing you're doing and these trips that you're making, you, you reference, you're going to these different communities, is that through the Poor People's Campaign? Is that where you're doing that through? I, I do a lot of it through the Poor People's Campaign. Before we had formed the Poor People's Campaign, I was doing it um, through the Cairo Center and from other things. And, and I also do, you know, I, I get a chance to do things like have awesome conversations like with you all, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's, it, it's, yeah, so it's both with the Poor People's Campaign and, and beyond, you know, with the Cairo Center, my, my organization. And I was hoping, and I, you know, I want to talk actually about, your, you know, both of those organizations. And so, um, Renee, I'm just going to take this one and then I'll, I'll hand it back. But could you tell us more about, and I, I don't want to presume that all of our viewers know about the Poor People's Campaign, um, you know, what it is, where it stems from and what your goals are and, you know, how kind of how it came together. That's a very broad question. We'll be here for an hour. But could you could you, you know, give us a little bit of introduction to that? Yeah, for sure. So the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival was inspired by the 1967-1968 Poor People's Campaign that Reverend Dr. King and the Welfare Rights Movement and Maz Horton out of the Highlander Folk School and, and Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers and a lot of different social justice leaders of the late 60s came together and said, you know, um, that we have to, that, that there was a like power of organizing and uniting poor people across especially racial and geographic lines, um, you know, because of the history of this country. Um, and so about 50 years after the original launch of that Poor People's Campaign, um, we, Dr. Barber and myself and, and, and grassroots leaders in, in more than 30 states across the country said, you know, we can't just commemorate um, uh, what others did before us, um, especially when there's unfun unfinished business. Um, especially when there's actually 60% more poor, poor people than there were in the late 60s um, mm -hmm. today. Especially when almost like more than 40% of the U.S. population, the richest country in like human history or one of them, like is poor or low income, like mm -hmm. or one emergency away from, from absolute economic ruin. We can't just kind of commemorate that. We have to 
we have to build a poor people's campaign for today. Um, and that that it's directly connected to calling for a national kind of moral revival. Um, and so back in, in 2018, we launched the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival with the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in 21st century history, um, where in state capitals simultaneously over the course of 40 days, folks um, you know, raise the issues and the connections between these five interlocking injustices. We started with systemic racism, we connected it to systemic poverty, we, we looked at the issue of ecological devastation and the denial of health care. We, we connected it with militarism in this war economy. And then we also um, said, you know, it's all kind of pulled together through this false narrative of, of religious nationalism. Um, mm -hmm. and so the campaign is, is really focused on those five interlocking injustices building the power of poor and low-income people, connecting poor and low-income people up with clergy and moral leaders and other advocates and activists to have these state-based movements. Um, and so, you know, in Maryland, there's a powerful Poor People's Campaign, a National Call for Moral Revival. And, and on March 2nd, for instance, in, in more than 32 states and state capitals across the country and in Washington, D.C., folks were taking action together, you know, making sure that in this election season, we're, we're lifting up the real issues that matter. Um, and, and since 2018, the Poor People's Campaign has continued to grow, doing both national and state-based kind of actions and activities. Um, you know, we have an agenda. Um, uh, we often will say we're not just cursing the darkness, we're shining a light on what's necessary and possible. And so that, that agenda, those demands that come out of our grassroots communities are what we're kind of organized around, oriented around. We have we have fundamental principles about how we do this work um, and what we believe, um, you know, that we live in the in this rich country. People shouldn't be, you know, uh, living in and dying from poverty. And yet one of the major leading causes of death in this country is poverty and inequality. Um, 800 people died today from poverty um, in this country. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's a quarter of a million a year. Right. Um, and uh, and and there is a cure, right? We know what to do. Um, yeah. And so a lot of what the Poor People's Campaign is doing is trying to both build that awareness, shift that narrative, but then also kind of uh, build that power to to be able to impact elections, be able to impact policies, and be able to to organize and mobilize people um, to to make sure that that the things that matter the most um, are at the center of our, our political discourse and our political decisions. And, so. and, and I think you've answered it. I, I wrote this down about 15 minutes ago, and I think you have, but I want to just peel back one more layer. And, and really, the question was, how do we not get distracted or how do we rise above those who seek to divide us, right? Mm. And I heard your answer, you know, through moral organizing, through, right? But then I guess the next question is, you're already operationalizing it, but how how do we, how do we get 800 people, how do we get more people to care? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I, I think that is a key question, right? And it's really the question of an organizer. It's like, how do you raise this awareness and how do you then get people both to care about the issue and then to be prepared to do something about it, right? Um, and and I really think, I, you know, again, I get to travel all around. I get to talk to all kinds of folk. Um, and, you know, I feel deeply encouraged by that because um, I think that people are are, are good um, and that people do care. Uh, I think we're often not told the truth or we don't. Um, uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily see that that there that it could be better than this, or how to get out of this mess, right? Mm -hmm. For sure, people are pitted against each other all the time, and you know, kind of sold these lies that you know, if people just prayed more and had fewer kids, you know, if 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 we just build a bigger wall at the U.S. Mexico border, 
um, that all of our problems will be solved. I mean, like, there, we, we know some of the things that people are, are told and that we're distracted by and, and that, they, that they do in fact, you know, tend to divide us. Um, um, so it's, it's not that we're living in some like, like, you know, uh, ideal place that like, that all of those things have disappeared and it's just easy. And we said, you know, we, we hold hands and we sing Kumbaya, like I, you know, this is, this is this context. Um, but, but I still find that like people are outraged, um, that, that people are dying from poverty. Um, people are, uh, you know, not, um, like are not content to sit by and watch folks have raw sewage in their yards or, you know, have, have to bury their kids for the lack of, you know, healthcare. Um, and that it really is about shifting the narrative, getting people to talk about who is poor, why are people poor, who's being impacted by racism, what can we do about it? You know, is it possible to do something about this climate change and ecological devastation, you know, what would a peace economy rather than a war economy look like and in, include? And is there a different narrative of, of inclusion and love and peace rather than this kind of false one of, of hate and division um, and, and war? Uh, and, and the thing is, is that, like when you shift that narrative and when you impact policies and elections, like you, you know, we talk about in the Poor People's Campaign, waking the sleeping giant, enlivening and enlarging this electorate of poor and low income voters. Um, and then when we kind of build that power, and again, that power to say yes, um, you know, yes to all the things that people need to thrive, um, then that's that's how you do it. And, and, you know, it means going community by community. It means it means going person by person. But but again, that's if if we go back to that that story and that that view of, of U.S. history, um, you know, people thought it wasn't possible until um, until people saw freedom, right? People th thought that like you know you were never going to get people on the side of of justice until until you did. Um, and so I, I I think that that it it doesn't make it easy, but it but it still makes it possible. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's, I think, deeply hopeful. I would love to um, hear just a, a little commercial about um, two things. One, the, uh, the work We Cry Justice, reading the Bible with the Poor People's Campaign. I'd love to hear what that's about. And then also about um, Always With Us, what Jesus really said about the poor. I would love, because I think it provides context, because this is who, right? This is, this is this is what we need to hear. Yeah. So um, as you said in my bio, I have a PhD in biblical studies um, um, and particularly have spent a lot of time looking at what the Bible really says about poverty and justice and, and these kinds of issues. I do that because um, so I was raised in the church. I was raised, you know, in a, a, a religious family. Um, I, I always saw kind of doing justice and um, like my my faith being completely connected. Um, mm -hmm. But I also tended to hear a lot of other kind of religion, um, whether it was from other family members or whether it was from society at large. I mean, I remember organizing with welfare recipients in the 1990s in the lead up to the welfare reform, um, where all of a sudden people were, were throwing around a lot of Bible throwing around a lot of morality, um, a lot of religion to kind of justify throwing moms and their kids off of, of social welfare programs. Um, and, and as long as I have been involved in kind of what I call a movement to end poverty, um, there is not really a week that goes by in my life when someone doesn't say, well, don't you know that Jesus said the poor will be with you always? Um, now, sometimes that comes from a person of faith, someone that's a, you know going to church and, and they know exactly where that fits in the Bible. Um, a lot of times it's actually people that will, will be a self-professed atheist or someone that, that, that isn't necessarily religious themselves, but they seem to know that there's a part of the Bible where it sounds like Jesus and God are condoning poverty. Um, mm -hmm. And so that actually 
basically is what kind of sent me to seminary, sent me into a PhD program. I mean, I was out there organizing and I found that like, you could, we couldn't actually end poverty out in the world with our hands and our feet and our minds if people kept on believing that it was impossible um, mm -hmm. to do so. Um, and there's lots of reasons why people think it's impossible to do so. Some of them are policy. Some of them are kind of larger economic things. But some of them are this kind of theological and biblical, you know, barriers, obstacles um, where we're you know, I was finding grassroots leaders having to kind of choose between their faith and their church and doing the work of building a justice movement out in the world. Um, and, and, you know, I found that confusing, but I also understood where it was coming from. Um, and so I kind of dove into doing a bunch more biblical studies. So that's where Always With Us comes. Um, it's, it's actually kind of a reinterpretation of, of that really fa famous passage, um, showing that in fact, when Jesus says that, that, that very famous phrase, you know, Jim Wallace calls it the most famous part about bi poverty in the whole Bible, um, that he's actually saying exactly opposite of how it's been interpreted. Um, mm -hmm. That he's saying that if there's poverty in the land, it's because people are being disobedient to God. Um, mm -hmm. And that God has been very clear about what society needs to do, what the, but what even the kind of government needs to do um, to eradicate poverty. And that's to cancel debt. That's to pay workers a living wage. That's to um, lift from the bottom. So everybody rises, you know, mm -hmm. organize society around the needs of the people. Um, and that's what's in the Jubilee codes. That's what's in the kind of prophets. Um, it's, it's the, the, the centerpiece of Jesus's inaugural sermon in, in his, in his kind of, return to Nazareth. It's it's the the program of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's there in that scene when he's being anointed as as Christ um, right before the, during the Passover holiday, right before he's killed as an enemy of the state. Um, uh, and and in fact part of why he's killed is because he's he's threatening the order of the day, like saying that instead of you know impoverishment and conquering by by the emperor and and by the empire of rome that this kind of empire of god this kingdom of god that jesus is about you know is is a place where everybody is in and nobody's out um and so so i i've done a bunch of biblical work on that and a bunch of also just kind of in the community talking to people about you know, these kind of ideas work. Um, and that's a little bit then connected to where We Cry Justice comes. Um, uh, it's a, it's actually a devotional. Um, mm -hmm. And it's for people of faith, but also people not of faith, right? Um, but kind of putting biblical passages and stories of people organizing today, grassroots leaders organizing today into conversation. And so it's, it's 53 different short chapters. Um, mm -hmm for for the 52 weeks of the year um and and again what what's included is like a, a bible passage and a story of someone organizing today and and then kind of some discussion questions for some stuff that people can kind of do their own selves um or in their uh community organization or in their congregation to kind of think about this issue of justice and mm -hmm. what impact they can have um, as an individual, as a community, as a congregation out in the world. And so um, so I'm, I'm excited about both of those. Really encourage folk to, to not just read and, and but also to, to do your own work um, looking at um, not just biblical texts but, but and faith, but but you know, all kinds of philosophy and theory and what it says about what kind of world we can we can be living in. Um, and, and not making us just uh, content to be abandoning people in the midst of abundance. Yeah, um, as you were talking, I was struck by a conversation I had, um, I guess it was the end of last week, um, from someone just asking like, you know, how do you keep from getting tired? How do you, how do you stay rejuvenated when it seems like the way it's not only coming, it's already crashed and right. And, and we're just, 
and I, I shared sort of, you know, what I, what I think and what I do, but I would love to hear from you because this work can be tiring. Um, so how, how do we keep from growing weary? Well, I want to hear what your answer was. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll tell mine after you because... Okay. All right. So, um, I mean, I... I do get tired and I do feel weary. Um, mm -hmm. Not so tired or so weary that it makes me stop, but I also think it's one of the things that I feel like COVID has taught me mm -hmm. and our society is that it's, it should be okay to be tired. It should be okay to mourn. It should be okay to, you know, just say things are not okay because um, they're not. Um, and it doesn't necessarily stop things from happening when you say that, you know, right. when when you pause and you mourn and, and grieve or just rest. Um, you know, one of the things about that Bible text I was just talking about, it's, it's the Jubilee, it's the Sabbath, right? And um, doing human rights organizing, my kind of growing up and into my young adulthood, <laughs> we would often... Um, look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the interconnection of all of those different rights, right? Mm -hmm. And there's political and there's civil and there's social and there's cultural and there's economic. Um, and, and we would focus sometimes on like the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to a job at a living wage and the right to an education that's free. Um, and we sometimes would, would skip over this one that was kind of the right to rest and vacation. Partially we did that because you know, poor folk in our society are, are always, you know, thought to be lazy, crazy and stupid. Right. And so mm -hmm. we felt like we had to not talk about rest. Um, uh, but, you know, we should we have to bring that one back in. It's there. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's part of what it is to be human. Um, but but I also think um, I from the perspective that I'm at as as someone who has definitely struggled in my life and but but you know, I, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, and, uh, I, I have housing and I have healthcare and, and when I spend so much time with folk that don't, um, it, it's who am I to, to, to say I'm too tired to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and not in a guilty kind of way, not in a, like, self-sacrificing kind of way, but I get so much energy from being with folks who, as Howard Thurman describes it, whose backs are against the wall and all they can do is push. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, 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 so on the one hand, I hold up rest and, 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 and Sabbath and, to, and, and self-care. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time, I also hold up, you know, just like, getting energy and power and strength and vibrancy in the struggle um, and amongst people who are, who are trying to make this world better. Um, and, uh, and kind of sitting both of those places, right. And just, and, and, um, and realizing that, you know, I can take it so far and then someone else is going to take the work, you know, that next part of the way. I mean, a favorite, um, Kind of prayer or poem is one that was was attributed. It's it's actually not his work, but it was read um, to Archbishop Ar Osco Romero, um, and it's it's called um, "Prophets of a Future Not Our Own." And and he and it, in it it talks about um, how you know no no not, no one thing is perfect and nothing is complete. Um, but that we kind of plant seeds that one day will grow. And I, I think a lot about, about the kind of planting of seeds and the mm -hmm. plowing of the field to plant those seeds. Um, and then kind of know that it's, you know, other people around me and people in future generations that will keep on keeping that struggle kind of alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I uh, so, oh, sorry, Renee. Is that okay? Can I jump in here? Yeah, I was going to answer, but oh, I you have to answer. I, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, Renee's got to no, answer. No, you got to answer. Renee show. <laughs> well, I'll say that it was through the lens of a different type of human rights work. It was, you know, 19 years of, uh, for me, just 
criminal prosecuting child abuse and sexual assaults and human trafficking and vulnerable adults and pornography, right? And and like, how do you not grow weary? How do you, right? And it's pretty much the same, but I kind of had three categories and that is, you know, you have to have a safe space where you can talk to folks at work mm-hmm. or family, but you don't want to bring it to your family. So it work, but with the type of work that we're talking that you do, it is, it's all connected. So there's not a separation, but being able to talk and laugh and cry when you need to. And having, for me, you know, being rooted in my family and my faith, that was the second thing. And then the third is speaking to that rest, right? Having rest and having out, you know, uh, other interests. It's okay to have other interests that take you away just, you know, and for me, it was music, right? Getting involved. And um, so I think we're saying the same thing. And I think that is, you know, probably the key to not growing weary. But as you said, it's okay to be weary. You just don't tap out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. I love no. that. I love that. The, um so, you know that you'll carry it as far as you can and then someone else will pick it up and carry it. I love that. I think that is extremely hopeful. And actually we have a question. We have a couple of questions from audience members and one of them I think ties in very nicely to that. And I, I'm, I'm going to pose them as time allows, but before we get to audience questions, although people watching, please do put questions in the chat and we'll answer as many as we can. But I do want to, um, uh, to have you talk about the Cairo center. Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think I started to a little bit, but um, the Cairo Center um, is dedicated to, to kind of raising up different generations of, of leaders. Um, you know, when and when we look at history, we see that that movements are led by lots of leaders, um, and that um, and the, those leaders have to be developed, right, um, and have to be nurtured, and have to be committed and connected. Um, and conscious and capable. Um, and so a lot of our work is really um, about, about doing that kind of leadership development work. Um, we, we also uh, produce all kinds of cultural resources. Um, if people are interested in songs and chants and artwork um, that's connected to the struggle, we have a lot of that on our website. Um, uh, we we host a kind of a, a political and spiritual community for movement activists that's called the Freedom Church of the Poor. And we have a Freedom mm-hmm. Shul of the Poor and a um, Iglesia del Pueblo. Um, so for folks that are looking for that kind of spiritual and political um, uh, place, um, community, um, please connect with us. Um, and and right now, in addition to, to building the Poor People's Campaign and, and helping to, you know, enliven, enlarge in this electorate of poor and low-income voters, we're particularly concerned um, about this rise of white Christian nationalism and mm-hmm. this kind of extremism. Um, and so uh, we we put out in the spring a report um, about um, some recommendations for what it's going to take for us to organize our communities uh, kind of learning from folks that are out there doing organizing work um, to really counter this authoritarian um, threat, this kind of threat to our civil and human rights, um, of this kind of political movement that um, is 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 highly exclusionary um, and is is gaining a lot more power and traction in our society. And so, if people are are interested, um, please uh, you know please check that out and, and get in touch and get involved. Um, again, we have lots of courses and resources and, and it's really about kind of each one teach one so we can reach one more, um, you know, this kind of uh, leadership development process. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I, I do hope that everyone here both joins our, our email list um, and gets involved in the Poor People's Campaign because again, there's folks locally and nationally that are, are involved really all across the country, um, so. And for, and for people watching, um, I have been putting links into the chat where you're watching. You should be have direct links to the Cairo Center and to the Poor People's Campaign and to the Poor People's Campaign Maryland, among other things. But if for some reason those aren't showing up for you, 
Um, Google's going to take you there, Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and the Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S Center. Um, I do want to just pose an audience question that, as I said, I felt really tied in with this idea of like, you're going to carry it as far as you can, and then, you know, someone else is going to pick it up because that, you know, and I think that's great for Renee and I and people who do the work with us to, to keep in mind too, that it's, you, you do what you can, and that that's, Awesome. So this question is from Nestor, who's wondering what are tips for some small actions that everyday, excuse me, everyday people can do in their daily routine that can help enact meaningful change. Yeah, I, I appreciate this because again, like it really takes us all, um, and um, and and in lots of small and lots of big ways. Um, so I think one is to be informed. Um, to actually look at how these issues, racism, poverty, militarism, environmental issues, um, religious nationalism are playing out, you know, other injustices are playing out. Um, and just knowing more about it, um, uh, you know, means that then we can make interventions that are smarter and and um, more effective. Um, I think two is is connecting with grassroots people and other just like neighbors and friends and folks that go to the grocery store with you or who are hanging out at the library with you. Um, and just making that connection, making that human connection. I mean, so much of our society today is about division, division, division. Um, and, and so being able to just, you know, make, make a connection to, to someone else that might be like you or might be nothing like you, um, and building that relationship. Um, I mean, I think, uh, 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 you know, there's there's lots of ways to get in even your daily life involved in kind of this a social and political movement. Um, so in this 2024 year, uh, you know, if you have an extra couple of five minutes, you could be calling or texting people to say your voice and your vote matters. You know, make mm -hmm. sure um, that that you you show up um, and 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 show up to to you know, put into office people on all levels of that ballot and around all issues that matter to you. Um, you know, I think right now there are regularly um, actions and protests happening around the environment, around systemic racism, police brutality, around war and peace, around economic justice, around living wages. You know, find something that is of interest to you that maybe impacts you or impacts someone close to you and and connect with an organization doing something. Maybe just sign up for their e-newsletter. Maybe, you know, um, follow them on, on a social media platform. Um, just even just like having one more person join an org grassroots organization social media platform, that makes a difference. We notice it, you know, like we got five new followers today. That means something, right? Like, um, and then especially if you then start sending it out, you know, if you're on social media or if, if you're, um, if you see a flyer, if you're, if you're more of a, uh, old school kind of person. So there's, there's lots of ways that it like, doesn't mean changing your life entirely, except for then maybe what's going to happen as you, as, as you meet those grassroots leaders in your community, if you're not already connected to them, it, it might change the direction that you want to go in. And you might just start, start having a slightly different daily routine and that's okay too. But, but even if, if that doesn't happen, just being more informed, being more connected and being more hopeful that this is not as good as it gets, I think it really goes a long way. That was awesome. Thank yeah, you. Was. Thank you. Renee, I think we've got time for one more one more question. Do you wanna do you wanna close us out with a question there? Yeah, but I wanted to end on I had a question, but this was so positive. <laughs> I I did have a question because maybe not everybody understands what milit militarism is. Maybe a a Cliff Notes version of what it is. Yeah, so um the federal discretionary budget um, has like 54 cents of every dollar spent on, on the military. And that's not just supporting veterans or paying for our frontline troops. That's um, money to military contractors. Um, that's, that's money to um, other kind of law enforcement that, that often doesn't have to necessarily be 
have a lot of oversight. Um, uh, in fact, the the federal government, the Pentagon, hasn't had to pass an audit pretty much in its history, um, uh, which which means that there's a lot of excess. It means that um, that there's a lot of 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 money that gets spent, um, you know, sometimes on nothing. Um, and sometimes on kind of weapons of, of war and destruction that are impacting, you know, um, young people um, and, and people both in the U.S. and across the world. Um, and so, so in, the, in, in the work that we do, we, we kind of look at this question of militarism. Um, so since 9-11, um, you know, uh, the United States has spent $21 trillion dollars on things to do with militarism. It's been like building a wall at the US-Mexico border. It's it's um, sending kind of tanks and other military grade weapons into our communities in the United States, especially our poor communities. It's, um, it's again, you know, huge military contracts for some of the richest um, corporations in the world. Um, and, and, you know, both, um, we we have a bigger military budget than you know dozens of of well and and some hundreds of countries combined or even the next you know five to ten countries their military budgets all added up together are still less than ours um, um, and it, so it doesn't really make the world safer um, uh, it and what it does is it drains really needed resources from from like from our communities um, going back into our communities. Um, so, you know, for instance, if, if just one uh, military contract for one corporation were to be instead uh, kind of reproportioned, it, it could, you know, it could fund all of our schools um, to a huge amount, right? Like, it, and so, the, the so a lot of why we talk about kind of militarism and a war economy is it's both not making the country safer and it's kind of draining needed resources out of of the kinds of things that are about civil and human rights um, and so um, and instead diplomacy and kind of dialogue um, uh, on a global scale um, often leads to to more health and wealth for everybody. Um, and then, then it frees up resources to be able to, um, uh, you know, take care, including take care of our troops. I mean, 40% of folks that are homeless adults, single adults are, are veterans. Um, mm. uh, you know, uh, many frontline troops are, their families have so little money, they're having to live off of food stamps and other um, governmental supports. And so, this money is not about actually um, honoring um, those who who serve our nation. Um, there, it's actually really just lining the pockets of some of the richest corporations in the world. Yeah, that is um, a lot of food for thought. Um, it sure is. Yeah, um, but in our last minute, I want to take us back to that positive and. You did a beautiful, really, you know, takeaway, what we can do. So if you could summarize, I loved, you know, just simple, right? Join the, the you know, join the listserv, like, right? But, but give us give us something inspirational for a takeaway. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest inspiration I have is that, that we can do better. Um, mm -hmm. And, and trying to spread, you know, in my Christian tradition, the good news, um, the Evangelion, that like, that it doesn't have to be this way, that mm -hmm. like, that we can have great schools, that folks can have health care, that we can raise wages, that we can protect voting rights, um, that that our schools can, you know, be places where where everybody is safe and, and you know, whole. Um, and so I, I think to me, like the, the kind of, the, the kind of charge I have is to like, not give in to kind of despair and hate and division, um, but to hold out the hope 
um, that actually, despite, you know, uh, lots of bad things happening, because I'm not going to deny that, like, you know, I mean, if half of the country is basically kind of in or near poverty, um, if if we have a bigger attack on voting rights than we've seen since the Civil War, like if, you know, if, if the climate is actually really in a crisis, because all of these things are true. Like, so I'm not saying that things are easy and and simple, but it but we have the power. People before us who had less to work with were able to achieve justice. And so we can do it today. And and it in it and there's not this is a moment we often say where many flowers can bloom, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to do it one way. We don't mm -hmm. have it doesn't have to all be the same. Yeah. Um, but but it has to be that we like hold out this possibility that that we can achieve justice. Um, and so and and then and do the little and the big things to make it so. Yeah, I love this. Many flowers can bloom. That's beautiful, mm -hmm. and that's true, right? Not binary. Every things can coexist. That's right. Oh, this has been amazing. Kyle, do you want to do closing? Do you want me to? How do sure. you want to do? It? I'll, I'll do them. I'll do them. I I just want. I do want to take a minute. I want to um, first of all. Um, Thank uh, the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, who's partnering with us for this event, as well as so many others, um, as well as our federal partners, the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And they're actually represented with us here tonight with Terrence Carr, who's backstage with us. So we ought to just thank um, the, EEOC, the EEOC for this event, too. Um, we also want to thank all of you watching. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean that very sincerely. We do this for you. And we appreciate the fact that you chose to spend your time here with us tonight. That's a real honor to us. Um, we hope that you have heard something that inspires you and that reminds you again of the power of one, the wonderful things that a single person can do with the life that they are given. And I think that that, you know, we've really heard that from you tonight, um, Dr. Liz. And so, and of course, thank you to you. It has really been a tremendous privilege for us to have you with us. It's like a, a gift to, uh, to us and to Prince George's County and to Maryland. So thank you very much for your time. And, uh, we just want to wish everybody the best and um, we hope to see you at some future events. And Dr. Liz, we definitely want to have you back. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's thank great you. to be with you all. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.